Okay, so I guess you end up going to prison and you get out on a work release program? Yep. Okay. And how old were you at the time when you got out? Uh, I got out, I was 23, 24 years old. Okay. And I guess you got a job at MTV? Uh, yeah. I went through several programs first within the work release, and that led me to uh, MTV. I actually was in a anti-gang, anti-violence program called the Amera I Can uh, Foundation for Social Change, which was actually Jim Brown, the Football Hall of Famous program. And I was one of, I was probably part of the first graduating class in New York City when the program was presented in New York. So once I graduated the program, I was asked and hired to be a facilitator to teach the program to other inmates in the work release facility and things like that. And I did it for quite some time. And that led them to offer me a job with MTV where I would be representing another program that was based out of California as well called the Streets Lights Assist, uh, Production Assistant Program. That program, you know, pulled me in and they got me to work at MTV. Okay, so what year did you start at MTV? Uh, the 94, late 94, mid to got late. It. Okay, so you start work at MTV, you're, you're fresh out of jail, and are you a rapper by this point? Nah, I'm still not a rapper. Okay. I said, I mean, I'm a hip hop fiend. I study all the music like a fiend, not a fan. It's a drug for me. And you know, I lived my entire life like that. You know, I come from being a graffiti artist, break dancer. But you know, once break dancing got played out in New York City by like 86, it was pretty much done. And you were laughed at for breakdancing by 86. So, you know, that kind of pushed my energy to do other things. And that's how all that other stuff started taking place. I didn't have those outlets anymore in hip hop. Okay, so what year did you actually start rapping? I would say like 95, 96. Okay, and was your first name Thurston Howell III? No, my, my original name was Big Vic the Barbarian, which is my low life name. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, I've always been pretty muscular since a teenager, you know, from going to prison young and things like that. And I've always maintained, you know, that knockout status. And that's why my name was the Barbarian. It was given to me by, rest in peace, Marco Polo, you know, one, a, an original low life founder. Well, when did the Thurston Howell III name come about then? Well, when, when I started rapping, I became a battle rapper, you know, and I would chase people down to battle. I would go anywhere. I come to your project, battle the whole project. I go to the clubs. I battle everybody, every famous artist I could find. I'm forcing you to battle me. And um, people started calling me thirsty because of that. Like nobody was like, I'm not going nowhere with you no more because you're thirsty. You just want to chase down rappers and battle and then, so the thirsty, that it kept sticking with me. And uh, I, I still haven't fully developed or found myself as an artist. And I took a trip to Massachusetts for the summer of 96. And I went there to really develop my pen game. And when I left there at the end of that summer, I was Thurston Howard III. Because then I figured out the character I wanted to use within my rap. You know, I'm a character on my music. I'm no different than... Dana Dane, Slick Rick, Jimmy Spicer, the rapping Duke. That was my approach to me, to me being creative. I wanted to be extremely creative with what with, with, with I was doing. So I took on that persona and became Thurston Howard III. But I never ever emulated anything from Gilligan's Island. You know, so right, I kept that's it original. Where the name, yeah, I mean, that's where the name came from. Yeah, right. but I, the, I spelt the, the, it differently. You know, mm -hmm. but um, I never ever took anything from the show just to show that I didn't have to. You know, I could totally be my own unique self as an artist without pulling from the Gilligan's Island show. Right, because there's a character on that show is the rich old guy. Yep, the millionaire. Uh, named the millionaire, Thurston Howell the yep. Third, spelled I, Thurston with a U. Yep, and I'm I'm the skillionaire. Because exactly. for me and hip hop is all about skills, so that's what I do. 
Right, and you played with that over the years. Like, for example, Skilligan's Island is obviously a play off Gilligan's yep. Island and, and that for, you know. Skillosopher, so Skillionaire, Serial Skiller, Skillitary, License to Skill, uh, Skillmatic, you know, all these are my album titles. Uh, my next album coming out now, I got Thought Skillustrated, then after that is Skillamanjaro, then it's Skillanthropist. So, you know, I've always had the titles locked in and that's something I got from EPMD. You know, mm. I seen how they always use the word business in their title. So I wanted to do something similar without biting, you know, so I flipped it in my own way. Well, when you talk about battling, I guess while you're working at MTV, you would basically try to battle any rapper that would come by? Yeah, I would get him. Okay, and uh, Jay-Z was one of them. Jay, yep. I tried to battle Jay mad times. He would always like shun me off, like you're not ready. You ain't you ain't got nothing for me, you know. I, I stepped to him at the MTV Awards in 1996 as well, and you know he brushed me off the same way, like you know you ain't you ain't ready for me. You ain't got nothing, you know. And that went on for a couple of it went on a couple of times. I seen Jay. Okay, but you actually did battle Coolio. Yeah. At at uh, I battled Coolio at a, a, a an award show called Fashionably Loud in at, at MTV, and I remember I had to wait for his team to come, you know, and him to show up so I could take him up the freight elevator. We were working out of the New Yorker Hotel, and um, when I got them in the elevator, I was like, "Yo, you know, you know what you got to do right now, right?" Because we got to get it popping on this battle, and Coolio didn't hesitate. He spit. He didn't even wait for me to finish. He just went into his rhymes and got busy. My respect <laughs> for Coolio after that day was pretty big, because even when I was up north, upstate, I would listen to the WC and the Mad Circle tapes, and I respected Coolio's skills. So I, I knew he wasn't just a commercial artist that had the gangster's paradise. You know, I knew he had real rhymes and real raps, and he proved it that day. Oh yeah, Coolio was nice, man. He had a string of hits. Yeah. Gangster's Paradise just sort of eclipsed everything, but he had a bunch of songs like County Line and so forth. Yeah, he, he was nice. Nah, that WC in the Mad nice. Circle, them tapes was fire. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, and you battled Buster Rhymes. I battled Buster. Yeah. Okay. I so you took that battle. Well, I'm gonna tell you, man. Look, I, I'm never gonna sit here and say I lost a battle to anyone, right? But like, I battled Buster at at the tunnel outside. Like I said, I'm hunting down rappers. So I'm at a red light and Buster pulls up right beside me. He's in the passenger seat. And when I seen him, I'm like, yo Buster, what's up? You want to battle? I said, pull over. He said, nah. And he started rhyming right out the window and we had a red light. So when, when he started rhyming, I just started responding with my rhymes. And we actually were backing up traffic and everything at the red light. So after we got our little one rhymes off, we pulled over and we probably went at it for an hour. You know, and the next day I'm hanging out with Buster. He's taking me to the labels, trying to help me get a deal. I didn't even have a demo at the time. Mm. But he took me to uh, Electra oh. the next day to meet Rick Posada. He had me spit for a bunch of different people. So, you know, you know, he was impressed, obviously, because he was willing to take me around and show me love and like, you know, let me know I had it. Okay, so here you are, you're, you're rapping, you're battling people, you know, you formed your name and your identity, and then in 1997, you were in the Source's Unsigned, unsigned Hype. Yeah. Which, at that point, like, there's really nothing like this anymore, but at that point, that was pretty much the quickest way to a record deal. Yep. If you were in Source's Unsigned Hype, every A&R all over the country is now looking at you as a serious contender. And for good reason, you know, my man, Matty C, who was part of that ar article uh, every month, I mean, Biggie came out of there, Common yeah. came out of there, Rigobert Bob Deep came out of there. Riggs Morales, too. Riggs was actually the guy who wrote uh, my story. You know, uh -huh. um, okay. that was the same day I battled Jay-Z, man, because I, I was doing a round. I had my first demo ever in a package, and I probably made a hundred packages and I went to every label imaginable and put one on everybody's desk. So when I went to the source, it was on my hit list that day as well. And um, when I went to the receptionist before, you could just get in the building and go all the way up. 
This was before all the tight security was everywhere. So, you know, I asked the lady uh, who does the unsigned hype column. And she was like, oh, you, um, she said his name, Riggs. And then, would you like me to call him out? And I was like, yes, please. And when he came out that back door, I just started spitting as soon as he seen me. I didn't introduce myself. I didn't do nothing. I just started spitting. And he said, you got it. You got it. You got it. Don't worry. You got it. I don't need to hear no more. You got it. Okay. So what changed after you were an unsigned hype? I was on Rikers Island when the unsigned hype came out, man. So that kind of, I had more battles now in the bathroom because I'm, you know, I'm over here doing a 90 day bid, some little skid bid real quick. And it just so happened it comes out while I'm doing that little skid bid. And all it did was like, get me more battles on Rikers Island. Okay. 